My name is Sim Kern and I write fiction about climate change. And for most of my life, I've been dealing with pretty severe depression and anxiety related to climate grief. And it seems to me that 2020 is maybe the year that a lot of people are waking up to their climate grief for the first time. Or maybe this is the first time it's become overwhelming or feeling unbearable. And as someone who in a way like processes climate grief professionally, I thought it might be helpful to share some of the mindsets and behaviors that I've picked up over the years that help me cope with the knowledge that our world is rapidly dying. First, let's get out of the way and talk about what is not helpful in the long term, but is very effective in the short term, which is climate denialism. And this is the status quo. This is what humans have mostly been doing as a species for the last 50 years. Scientists, politicians have known that we were headed for climate catastrophe and we've just done nothing. We've said maybe it won't be so bad. We've just kind of stuck our heads in the sand. As a climate activist, as a climate writer, I'm not going to tell you to just forget about it and say it's going to be okay. I'm not going to give you platitudes that are scientifically false. 2020 has been a terrible year, but when you understand climate science, you also understand that it's probably going to be the best year of the next 20 years. And I'm not going to lie to you and pretend that that's not true because in the long term, climate denialism makes everything way worse. We're not going to be able to address climate change until an understanding of the severity of the problem and a commitment to acting is so widespread that it's undeniable. And so in a way, I think it's really great that this is the year that everyone's waking up to climate change. Like in a way, this year gives me more hope than any of the last 19 years that came before, because if you've been a climate activist since the 2000s or the 90s or the 1970s, you've felt very alone with it until now. We're going to learn more about climate change and hold the full reality of it in our minds and not get so depressed and anxious and overwhelmed that we can no longer function and we can no longer take actions to try to make a difference. Um, and just a little bit about me and my story. The first time I remember feeling terrible climate grief was in 1999. I was in eighth grade and I had the flu and I had a really high fever and all I wanted to watch was like cute cuddly animals. So I watched Animal Planet all day. And back then it was just like all pretty much the same format, like little 30 minute shows on a different species. And every single show ended the same way with the you know narrator saying these wonderful, adorable animals are in decline. They're threatened by climate change. They're threatened by habitat loss. And by the end of the day, and after watching episode after episode after episode, I realized like, oh my God, we're, we're killing the entire planet. Like little old eighth grade me had their first climate induced panic attack and realizing humans are destroying life on earth everywhere on every continent. That was, that was difficult to process. <laughs> um, and this was in 1999. This was before even An Inconvenient Truth came out. My parents, who were, you know, good liberals at the time and, you know, voted Democrat their whole lives, didn't believe in climate change. They acted like I had linked up with some conspiracy theory. They didn't understand why I suddenly passionately wanted to go vegetarian and only wanted to buy organic clothes and got really upset when they were just leaving the lights on and the water running and all this stuff. Um, it was rough and it was tough to be alone. And that's why having been in this fight for now 20 years, it is heartening to see all of a sudden, finally, that there is widespread acknowledgement that the climate is changing, that we need to do something urgently. And I hope that my experience of like dealing with these feelings of grief and anxiety can help some of you out there who maybe haven't ever had a panic attack about climate change until this year. So with that, let's get into it. A lot of these mindsets come from Buddhism, which I have found very helpful um, to me in dealing with my depression and anxiety related to climate change. And so a little bit of self-awareness, I am going to be that white person on the internet telling you about Buddhism. <laughs> Highly recommend that you go follow the experts. I um, love the YouTube channel Plum Village, which is just the YouTube channel of the order of 
Buddhist monastics founded by Thich Nhat Hanh give talks on YouTube about Buddhist thought and it's through listening to those while I was trying to fall asleep at night, gripped by like climate panic, found some of these ideas that have been extremely helpful to me in hanging on. <laughs> Before I go any further, I just want to say like, it is definitely possible to feel climate grief so intensely that you start to have suicidal ideation. And I've experienced this and I know friends who've experienced this. If you are having suicidal thoughts, please call a hotline, tell a trusted friend or family member that you're having these thoughts and then make sure that you're not alone while you're having these thoughts. We need the people on this planet who care about the climate. The fact that you care about our natural world so much that it's causing you this great pain is a good thing and it means you're one of the good ones and we need you here. We need you in this fight and so please take care of yourself. If you're feeling suicidal, this video I don't know, it might help, but it might make things worse. So before you go any further, I would just say like, I am not a licensed psychologist and I would strongly encourage you to, to reach out to someone who's a professional if, if you're having those feelings. So with that said, let's get to some of the aspects of Buddhist thought that have been really helpful to me um, in terms of dealing with my climate grief. The first one is to breathe. <laughs> When you're having a panic attack or whenever you uh, read something in the news about the climate change or about environmental destruction that just gets you in the gut, just breathe. Focus on your in-breath and your out-breath. Feeling the air coming into your lungs, feeling the air coming out, coming back to your breath throughout the course of a day as you're getting anxious, as you're getting depressed is so powerful. It's such a powerful practice. It's really hard. <laughs> to get the hang of it and, and you can spend a lifetime studying Buddhism and practicing um, just focusing on your breathing, but it truly is like so powerful in terms of when you're starting to feel overwhelmed and you're starting to uh, feel like you just can't process everything, just try to shut down your mind and focus on being alive. Just focus on your breathing until you can kind of calm down. The next sort of tenet of Buddhism that goes along with that is living in the present moment. This can be really hard when you're passionate and knowledgeable about the climate. I recently read a piece by, which I will link to, by a great climate activist. Um, she's a black woman, Mary Heglar, and she also is always centering like Black Lives Matter in the climate movement, which is so important. And she wrote an article about, you know, standing on the bridge in San Francisco a few years ago, looking out at the San Francisco skyline for the first time. And, um, and already for her, she was grieving because already she could see those hills on fire. She knew it was coming. And then this summer that happened, right? And the pictures came out of those beautiful hills burning. And um, that's very real when you're a climate activist, when you're an environmentalist, like, it's hard to even enjoy nature, which you love so much because you go out into it and you see it burning. <laughs> and um, I was with my three-year-old daughter at Prazos Bend last week, which is a swamp near here. It's a wetlands and usually it's just, you know, uh, full, of, it's full of alligators and wildlife and you see roseate spoonbills and like all these amazing birds and... Um, we were having a great time, but it was at the, it was at the lowest water level it's ever been when I've been there. And, um, I had just read about how there are some wetlands in Brazil that are some of the wettest lands on earth and they're burning. And, um, when you're a climate activist, it's hard not to go anywhere in nature and not see death and destruction all around you. There's that coming back to your breath thing. <laughs> I did not think I was gonna cry making this video. Um, when you have those moments where you are fearing the future and you are finding it unable to enjoy the present, come back to your breath. Um, I recently saw a really powerful talk by Sister D from the Plum Village monastic community that I'll also link to that is where she's talking about an important part of Buddhism is allowing yourself to grieve and allowing yourself to be happy. Like 
allowing yourself to feel, allowing yourselves to suffer, I think is what she called it. So in those moments, like right now, or when you're out somewhere in a forest and you are imagining or understanding that this ecosystem is not long for this world, breathe and just let yourself feel that grief. Don't push it away. Pushing it away leads to that climate denialism and that inaction that will ultimately get us all killed. And it will cause us to do a lot of, you know, when we push down grief, usually anger is what bubbles up. So let yourself breathe and imagine your suffering as like a baby that you're holding in your arms. And it is right and good to grieve for the environment. It is right and good to grieve for every tree that is cut down. Like, and we have become so disconnected in our modern American colonized society, capitalist society. Like, we don't feel the grief that is natural to feel when you see a tree cut down. And when you hear of a species going extinct or a hundred species a day going extinct, it is right and good to feel that grief. And so let yourself feel it. Imagine your grief is something you can hold in your arms and take care of and breathe and feel it. Okay, but the other side of Buddhism is also give yourself permission to be happy. And this was really powerful for me to hear because when you're in deep with the environmentalist movement, there's always something more you can be doing. It is impossible in our society, in my life in Houston right now, to live carbon zero, to live without creating a devastating impact on the environment because that's the way our society is set up. You can always feel like you're not doing enough. You can always feel like that despair, but give yourself permission to be happy. So when you're in the forest and you have that vision of things burning, feel your feelings, feel your suffering, and when it's sort of, when you breathe through it and when it's sort of calmed down, then remind yourself, I give myself permission to be happy in this moment. There are beautiful trees around me right now. I am in this moment right now. I am alive in a universe that is just a, mostly a vast, cold, empty void. And there are birds singing and the sun is coming through the trees and it is beautiful in this moment. And I'm giving myself permission to be happy and alive in this moment. And don't make yourself carry around this grief all the time. Give yourself permission to set it down and just enjoy the natural world. Um, I heard that last week and I really needed to hear it. <laughs> I might cry through this whole video and that's okay. I'm gonna let myself feel my feelings. <laughs> I never talk about this stuff like so directly in a way I'm always writing about it and processing it because like I said, I'm a climate fiction writer. Like I'm always talking about climate change, but I've never um, done this. I've never talked about how I cope with it and it's, uh, it's bringing up some stuff. <laughs> Another thing uh, that I've taken from Buddhism is the five remembrances. So this is going to seem kind of counter counterintuitive if you're not familiar with Buddhist thought, but bear with me. So the five remembrances are something that Buddhist um, practitioners uh, remind themselves of every day. And they're basically like all of humanity's deepest, darkest, most primordial fears. <laughs> And they're also like some of the deepest truths about life. A lot of our destructive behavior comes from denialism of these truths. So Buddhist practitioners remind themselves of five things every day. They acknowledge that these things are true. And then they get that out of the way. So then you can spend your day without fighting and striving against these unconquerable truths. You've accepted them. And when I've tried to talk about this with other people, Sometimes I'm like, why? That's so depressing. Why would you remind yourself of those five things every day? But I find it incredibly calming and helpful. It's become a mantra for me. I do try to remind myself of these things every day. And when my climate grief gets overwhelming, I can remind myself of these things and it like, it settles it down. It's just like an acknowledgement of, of how things are. So the, the five remembrances are, and they're worded different ways in different places, but this is the wording that I liked and that I memorized. I cannot escape getting old. I am of the nature to age. 
I cannot escape ill health. I am of the nature to get sick. And that one doesn't mean like, okay, don't wear a mask, run around and get COVID. Like definitely the monastics of Plum Village and you know around the world are being very careful to, to not get COVID if they can help it. But just it's an acknowledgement that our bodies will get sick at some point and no one goes through their life from birth to death without experiencing illness. Um, and so uh, we, can we can definitely protect our health, but it will be impossible to have perfect health all your life. The third one is, I cannot escape death. I am of the nature to die. This is where sometimes you lose people. Why is it comforting to remind yourself every day that you're gonna die? I don't know, because I think our denialism of our own mortality causes us a lot of grief when we pretend we're not finite beings on this earth. Um, we act in, we act out in ways that try to make us feel artificially immortal and that are ultimately unhealthy. I'm going to die regardless of whether or not we win the climate fight. Like I, I'm gonna die regardless of what decisions I make today. So it's, I don't know, it just kind of settles me down. It's, it's helpful to me. Um, okay, the fourth one is one of the most powerful for me in terms of coping with climate grief. So the fourth one is all of the people, places, and things that I love will change. The nature of the universe is change. You can sit with that truth forever, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's true, right? It's obviously true. The nature of the universe has changed. Nothing in the universe is static. Nothing is permanent. And that just helps me because climate change is just a big change. It's, in my opinion, way too much change, way too fast. We don't need to go through a mass extinction. This didn't need to happen. And Buddhism also teaches that all life is precious, right? It doesn't mean we just accept that everything's going to die and change and wither away. It's not nihilism. It's not nihilism. But it's accepting that truth at the same time as you're holding your hand that life is inherently precious to us. But we know that it's all going to change. It's every being that lives is going to die. Like every species that exists will someday go extinct. Like we can hold both of those truths at the same time. I don't know. It helps me. The fifth remembrance. My only true possessions are my actions. I cannot escape the consequences of my actions. This is the one that charges us to do something. <laughs> um, and, you know, nothing that you buy, nothing that you own. You can't take any of it with you when you die. <laughs> But your actions, you know, and all of that could be taken away from you at some point. But your actions are the only thing that you truly own. And you will reap the consequences of what you sow. And I think we need that message as a species on climate. Like, we will reap the consequences of our actions. But as individuals, too, it's like, all I can control is myself and my own actions. So what actions can I take? whatever, you know, whatever ways I can to do something in this fight against climate change. And I'm going to talk about what those actions are in a minute. And it's not going to be a list of platitudes like use a reusable straw. Like <laughs> we're going to get real. <laughs> those are the five remembrances. Maybe they, maybe, you know, try it out. Try sitting with those five truths. Try memorizing them and reciting them to yourself and seeing if they bring you some kind of peace. Um, but I, I challenge anyone to tell me that any of those aren't true. One more like principle from Buddhism that I've taken that's helpful is that anger is not a very sustainable um, motivating energy and anger is really toxic and it is I'm a naturally very angry person. <laughs> Individual humans in particular I could go all day on the politicians and world leaders that I hate but anger and hate are not they're not, they don't sustain you for long-term work and action, which is the kind of work we're going to have to do. What is more helpful is <laughs> to be able to transform your anger into compassion. And one way that I, one sort of mental exercise that I've found helpful in doing this is thinking about human beings on the timeline of life on earth and on the timeline of evolution. 
as toddlers. <laughs> so we are not, we are a very young species. We are brand new to Earth. And we are also Earth's first species to ever become self-aware and develop language and develop technologies. And so we have this incredible power at our fingertips and we're just still little babies in terms of learning to live with our ecosystems and in terms of, you know, adapting to our environment. And we just, and so it helps me to think of human beings as like, we're all just as a species, we're a toddler throwing a temper tantrum. You know, if a toddler was left alone, unsupervised on a planet, they would wreck the place and they would t probably kill themselves. And so thinking about us as just young and confused and lost and unable to take care of ourselves generates in me a feeling of compassion that is less poisonous <laughs> to my psychological space than feeling incredible anger towards humanity as a whole. And, and so when I feel myself getting too angry and too hateful and it's starting to like erode my well-being, I come back to this image of human beings as toddlers <laughs> stumbling around the earth, destroying everything. And with it, the hopes that someday we will grow up and take better care of our home and ourselves. Another sort of train of thought that helps me be compassionate is the cosmic perspective. So we're just one planet circling a tiny star in the hundred billion stars that are in our galaxy which is one of two million million galaxies in the universe and there could very well be multiple universes and so on the scale of the universe we're just such a teeny tiny squishy little blitz um and our problems are just ultimately totally insane someday the sun is gonna go supernova anyways and wipe out all life on earth so we're doing it a little sooner um, I do have hopes that, that we will come through this. We will address climate change. We will work towards uh, a non-capitalistic society where the earth is sustained and all people on it are sustained and everyone treats life as precious. And then we can go from there to developing technologies that will allow us to spread beyond our tiny solar system and hopefully outlast the dying of our star, you know, which is, four billion years from now, so we've got time. But I find it calming to have that perspective, to have the perspective that we're all alone on this tiny blue dot. We're all we've got. And that, that instills a sense of, again, compassion in me rather than anger and um, reverence for the uniqueness of life in the universe. It can also be terrifying because to think about, you know, climate change times the universe because life is so incredibly precious and unique in the vastness of space and we're on track to really wreck it. I don't know. I also find it calming just to think of, to to read about space and its bigness and the amazingly enormous forces at work that are completely outside of our control. <laughs> All we can control again is our actions and what we do on this on this world compassion for us. We're doing our best. And a final thing that really helps me when I'm just super depressed and can't get off the couch is my kid and being around kids. And I know it's tough right now in the pandemic. Some people are isolated where like it's just you maybe by yourself, which is a really bad situation for mental health. But if you have like a niece or a nephew in your life, if you don't have um, kids of your own, if you if you can do some kind of mentorship or something, maybe even online, uh, remind yourself that there are kids, there are babies being born right now. And sometimes that's the kick in the pants I need is like my daughter needing me to get her something is what gets me up out of bed when I can't seem to face the day. And in a way, like all the kids on earth and all the babies being born and all the baby little animals being born need us to get out of bed and do something about climate change. And I know sometimes when you're really depressed, that sort of like kick in the pants, just get yourself up feeling can be, can be harmful. I don't know, but sometimes it helps, right? Sometimes it's just like, yeah, you're the grown up in the room. I really don't like this like, oh, Greta will save us. Like the children will save us. It'll be the next generation. We just have to get it right for the next generation. We have to fix it for the next generation. And the older you are, the more responsibility you have to do that. 
So what are you doing? You know, we, we have to do this for the kids. I've always found that really motivating. When I'm too depressed to do something for myself, um, both when I was a teacher and now that I have a child of my own, like I want to do it for the kids. And so, you know, I, I believe in humanity. I, I, I can't afford to just give up. I can't afford to give up hope. I can't afford to stop believing in humanity. I would never betray my daughter like that because there are kids here. There are kids who need us and who need us to figure this out and fix it. I can't afford myself to just fall into despair and give up and um, climate nihilism, you know, where you're just like, well, we're all fucked, screw it, you know, we can't fix it, no way, no way we can take on capitalism, no way we can redo all the industries on earth, so I guess we'll just die. Like, I can't take that attitude because I've brought a child into this world and because even if I hadn't, there are billions of kids here that need us to make a future for them and that deserve it. So um, sometimes that's what I need to keep fighting. Those are some of the mindsets that have helped me when I'm feeling overwhelmed, when I'm having a panic attack, when the existential crisis gets to be too much that can help me breathe through it, take care of my feelings and, and come out the other side and have some energy to take actions because I'm, I'm sorry, but the number one thing that's actually gonna help you feel better is to take actions. Cause we have to take actions to fix climate change. This terrible grief and anxiety isn't gonna go away until we stop murdering all life on the planet. So let's talk about which kinds of actions are more and less helpful. When I'm in a deep place of climate dread, it I, I feel like nothing I could do could possibly make a difference. If you understand the scope of the problem, you can feel very, very powerless. <laughs> and like, what do my actions even matter? Again, climate activists who've been in this fight for a long time, far longer than me, have been shouting into a void, into unreceptive audiences. Y'all have dismissed us and <laughs> not liked our posts when we put them on Facebook being like, the planet's dying. And you'd be like, yeah, it's 2003, you're way early on this. What we need is just a critical mass of people just totally understanding the problem, the urgency of the problem, the scale of the solutions we're gonna need. That's the only way these massive societal changes and transformations that have to occur are going to come. Otherwise, we stick our heads in the sand and we just run straight to apocalypse. So the fact that you're here, that you're waking up, that you're wanting to learn about climate grief and how to cope with it better, that's a great first step. The next step I would say if you're like new to learning about climate change is learn as much as you can. It's important that we understand the problem, that we understand the science. What are the mechanisms at play? That way you'll also be able to tell the difference between political solutions that actually will make a difference and ones that are just PR stunts because a lot of the BS <laughs> going around is just PR stuff that really won't make a difference in terms of climate. If we're going to solve the problem, we have to understand it. So read a book about climate change, you know, start researching, just go Google climate predictions, climate change, you know, start read, make sure you're reading like actual scientific studies and not, you know, Breitbart or something, but get a handle on what's to come so that you're prepared because it's coming, whether you're prepared or not, whether you know it's coming or not, it's going to come. I think it's better to be prepared. At the same time, again though, it's easy to get overwhelmed. So when you feel, when you're reading about climate change, you're learning about climate change and you start to feel that grief, use your breath, honor your grief, comfort it, <laughs> hold it in your arms like a baby, allow yourself to suffer, allow yourself to feel that climate grief. And then when you're ready, you know, keep learning. The second thing you can do is just Commit to being in this fight. Start thinking of yourself as a climate activist. Too long in the environmentalist community, we've had like purity tests. And like, if you're not vegan and zero waste and this and this and this, things that honestly like require a lot of privilege to accomplish, right? If you're not living the perfect Paragon eco lifestyle, um, which you have to be pretty rich in the United States to access, then you're not allowed to call yourself an environmentalist. You're not allowed to call yourself a climate activist. I want everyone thinking of themselves as climate activists. 
So even if you're kind of putting the cart before the horse, start thinking of yourself as a climate activist. Even if you're, even if just the first thing you've done is like be right here watching this video, because we we need everyone committed to this fight. So tell your, start thinking of yourself as someone who's in the fight against climate change, and then slowly take those steps to get more and more involved in that fight. Tell your friends. That's huge. Like go on social media and tell people like, you know what? I've been sleeping on climate change until now and I'm just waking up to the scope of the problem and I want to be a climate activist <laughs> and I want y'all to know about it because when you're one of those people like me who's always been an environmentalist and I've always been talking the ears off of all my friends and families about climate change, like my post about, oh, here's another thing about climate change, like doesn't mean as much. Honestly, it doesn't hit as hard coming from me. But when I see one of my like comfortable with the status quo <laughs> co-workers who lives the suburban American dream, all of a sudden posting their urgent feelings about climate change, that's more impactful. It hits harder because you're saying, you know what, I've been fine with the status quo till now and whoa, all of a sudden I'm waking up and all those other people who didn't like think of you as like a climate activist before and look up to you, they're going to be thinking, oh gosh, they're a climate activist. Maybe it's time for me to be a climate activist. Um, so yeah, just commit to being a climate activist and start talking about it. Like that's I know it feels like it's not enough, but that's huge. We need everyone to start doing that. So go with that. In terms of what next steps to take, I want to break down what I think is a really harmful false dichotomy, which is the idea that we have to like pick between systemic change and individual change when it comes to lowering carbon emissions. You know, particularly on the, the left, when you're involved in leftist discourse like I am, we are always centering and keeping at the forefront of everybody's mind that corporations and governments must be on board to address climate change. The vast majority of emissions come from 10 corporations. Individual people, consumer power will never change their behaviors. Down the road from me, they're building new plastic refineries in Texas to deal with an excess of natural gas fracked from the earth that we never needed because there's no demand for it. Fracked gas is worth shit. So they're turning it into plastic that there's currently no demand for, but they're just gonna make this plastic and make it dirt cheap to get us even more hooked on disposable plastic so that they can retroactively justify the demand for building 100 new plastics refineries in the next 10 years. That is something that is fucking happening. There's no amount of like consumer power that can affect it. The only thing that can affect it is government's power of the people, right? Which is what government is supposed to be, not power of the corporation. It's supposed to be, should be power of the people stopping corporations from doing these kinds of like suicidal, like mass extinction suicidal shenanigans. But anyways, so so this 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 idea that either individual changes like me becoming vegan, oh everyone just needs to become vegan. All of us individually need to stop using our disposable straws and eat more beyond beef and then we can solve climate change. No, there has to be massive governmental control of these corporations that are very aggressively destroying the planet. There has to be massive governmental regulation of industries that are killing all life on earth, okay? That has to happen. There, we, we, the individual changes won't do it. But on the other hand, on the other hand, okay? So we need the public systemic big governmental changes. But on the other hand, then there are some advocating for these changes who say, so it's meaningless for you to go to vegan. So. Who cares if you reduce your carbon footprint? Like, don't worry about it. Eat a burger and come to the protest. Well, I just think that personally, on a psychological level, it is helpful as a climate activist who's in it for the long haul to take steps to reduce your carbon footprint. I think you will find it soothing and you'll be able to live with yourself better. Take it a step at a time and you're never going to be perfect. Know that it's a journey. That the project of trying to live with a lower carbon footprint in a high consumption society like the US or the UK or Canada or most of the Western European countries, you are going against society every step of the way. You are going against the prevailing 
wisdom and ways of being and ways society is set up. Um, it's often more expensive, more time consuming, more energy consuming to lower your, to do things in a lower carbon way. But I do think that the individual transformation of our consumption, it gives us an integrity as climate activists and it, it gives us an integrity with ourself. It makes it a little bit easier to live with yourself and to live with your carbon footprint when you know you're on a path of gradually reducing your consumption. So there's this false dichotomy, I think, saying, oh, we just need to focus all our efforts on public change or the total fiction, which is that as long as you individually make your carbon output, you know, as close to zero as possible, then that's what will transform the world. We don't need to engage publicly. We don't need to engage governments and corporations. That's obviously not true. But I think that as a climate activist, what I've found is I need to make sure I'm doing both. What am I doing in the public fight? And for me, that's really what I found to do is like writing, putting content like this out there, um, you know, tweeting about it. Honestly, social media is like one of the ways that we impact discourse. I'm using my words, being vocal on social media, um, working in elections, you know, supporting progressive candidates, voting for progressive candidates, attending every protest that's environmentally related that I can. Houston is not a protest city. So unfortunately, like that is, there's not a culture of that there and there's not a lot of that going on here. Although I do show up, you know, when when those actions happen and I can. But I think for me, it's it's really become about writing and using my voice to, to talk about climate change that I've found is the way I'm pub publicly engaging. And then in my personal life, I've been on this journey to lower my carbon footprint for, for many years. When it comes to making those personal changes, I would recommend reading, again, learning about your carbon footprint. There are carbon footprint calculators you can use online. There's all kinds of apps and websites and stuff where you can find out what behaviors of yours are causing the most damage. And I would target those sort of big things first. You can kind of do a calculus um, as you're thinking about making changes to your lifestyle of what is high impact, what's going to reduce my carbon footprint the most, and what takes the most energy. If it's like a high impact change, with a, it takes a little tiny behavior for you, a tiny behavior change for you to make it, it's pretty easy. Do those first, you know, and then tackle a bit more slowly the ones that, that are like, big carbon change, but big effort. Like for example, going vegan. So I'm full disclosure, not fully vegan. My family members aren't really on board with being vegan. I have chronic anemia, which makes it difficult for me to be vegan, but I have managed to cut out like all beef and pork for many years. Um, I've reduced the dairy that I eat um, drastically. Growing up in the Midwest, like <laughs> every single meal had like a coating of cheese on top. Um, so I've really tried to draw down my dairy intake quite a bit. Dairy, if you're, if you're worried about like climate and carbon, actually cutting out just like beef, pork, and dairy will make a greater impact than going vegetarian because chicken and fish if you and eggs, if you keep those in your diet, they have a much lower carbon footprint than dairy does. Um, in terms of cutting out dairy, again, don't, I, I don't think it's super successful to take an all or nothing approach. I have to be vegan or I'm not helping. If you can cut down to dairy where you're just using butter, like that, and you cut out milk and you've cut out, you know, putting cheese on top of everything, like that is pretty huge. Um, in terms of going vegan, start learning to cook one vegan meal a week, right? And, and gradually over time, you're gonna learn to love vegan food and you're gonna learn those recipes that you find filling and delicious and sustaining and that you crave, it's hugely helpful to be a half-time vegan, <laughs> you know, to, to okay, I'm, I'm not going to eat beef and pork at all, uh, my dairy, I'm just going to use butter, and every other night I have a vegan dinner. Like, that's a um, drastically lower carbon footprint than someone eating steak every night. These incremental changes matter, and I think for people just starting out on environmental activism, the idea that they have to go all or nothing is really unhelpful. The same comes with um, like plastic use reduction. Plastics, a lot of people think about the pollution aspect, but the production of plastics creates a ton of carbon emissions as well. So the, 
our reliance on disposable plastic is absolutely devastating the environment. Like I said, down the street from me are chemical refineries, plastic refineries um, that are poisoning the air that I breathe. So less plastic is good. Again, though, those refineries are getting built and expanded on whether or not you buy the plastic. They've already made the plans, even though there's no demand yet, just because of a surplus of natural gas from fracking that they're going to turn into plastic that will never biodegrade. Anyways, in terms of reducing plastics, you know, get used to bringing your produce bag. You can get reusable produce bags and bring those to the store. Hopefully you're already using reusable grocery bags to take to the store. Um, you can, you could also start adding in now the produce bags. And once you get used to that, what else can I cut out? Can I start using soap nuts in my laundry instead of um, the laundry bottle detergents that come in plastic. Can I start using solid shampoo and conditioner and soap instead of um, soap that comes in plastic bottles? Can I start, you know, my cosmetics? Am I looking for environmentally low, uh, low plastic or no plastic packaging? Every single area of your life, you know, can you can take these steps, but it takes a long time, man. It takes years. If you're doing like one change a week and then getting used to it and then like, okay, what am I going to change this next week? It's going to take you years to be on this journey to eventually having lower waste. But I found having been on this journey for a long time, you know, life gets uh, more fulfilling and I, I find it easier to live with myself when I know that I'm doing all these things to try to reduce my personal carbon footprint at the same time, never losing focus that the most important fight is the one in the public sphere and is with politics and government regulating industry. That's what has to happen for us to avert total climate apocalypse. And the last thing that I've found that is super helpful is processing my climate grief through art, obviously. So I write books about climate change worlds. I write books set in the near future, the far future, but usually my works have to do with climate change. It preoccupies me and it's never going to go away. I've tried living for years, sticking my head in the sand about it. But I think once you wake up to climate grief, it's always going to be with you. Writing stories about it, for me, is ultimately therapeutic. and. I think that the people who've read my stories have found it to be, you know, they, they tend to say like, wow, that hit really hard. That, that looks, that seemed really dark and plausible. And yet it was good. Like my stories always have that core of optimism because I'm trying to convince myself that even in the climate ravaged futures that we're likely headed for, there will still be reasons for living. There will still be joy and people falling in love. There will still be people fighting for the climate to the bitter end. And that no matter how much is destroyed of the natural world, and no matter how tiny and sad of a sliver is left, that will be worth fighting for. Until the last little bit of wilderness is stamped out, that wilderness will be worth fighting for. And those are the main central themes of my work that I keep coming back to time and time again. And directly confronting my climate grief in this way and writing fiction about climate change has, it, it helps me. It helps me. I hope my books help other people too to process their climate grief and don't just like bum them out. <laughs> um, I want to show people still holding fast to their identity in the face of climate change, still holding fast to their community in the face of climate change and choosing their better instincts rather than their worst instincts when, when the shit hits the fan. This video ended up being longer than I thought it would be and a lot more emotional, <laughs> but hopefully it, it spoke to you and hopefully it's helpful to some of you. Um, in the description, I'll put a lot of links to some of the articles and um, channels and things that I mentioned. Um, I'll put links to some of my writing if you want to read some fiction about climate change. Oh, I should mention other like climate authors that I really love. Um, like Barbara Kingsolver has a lot of books dealing with climate change. Margaret Atwood has some dystopias which are a bit bleaker and darker. Um, one that I really highly recommend is The Overstory by Richard Powers. This is a book about trees. <laughs> it's a very long book about trees. It's one of the most beautiful works of fiction I've ever read. Um, and it will make you 
love trees and grieve for trees and what's happening to trees in the context of climate change, just, oh, you will feel your feelings on this one. But ultimately, I'm so glad I read it. And it's one of those books that like, oh, it, it makes life more precious to you, <laughs> if that makes sense. It makes trees more worth fighting for. And so I'm really glad I read it. Um, I really highly recommend this book. Please let me know in the comments if this was helpful. And uh, if you have ways that you cope with climate change that could be helpful for me, I'd really love to hear what they are. Please leave those in the comments or this video can be a tag. I'd love to hear from other artists and content creators who struggle with climate grief. Like how do you cope? How do you cope with it? Um, I think this is a conversation we should be having everywhere. So feel free to, to take this video and run with this idea. I hope that all of you I can count on as comrades in the fight against climate change. Um, and I love you. I love the natural world and I want us to save it. And that's all I got today. I'll see you next time. Bye.